Welcome to this series of lectures where we will be discussing this amazing human body that we each live in and its ability to heal itself. You see, the human body was designed to heal itself and it will heal itself if you give it the right conditions. Just as my orange tree will give me beautiful oranges if I give it the right conditions. Now let's go to the gut of the human being. Way, way down in our gastrointestinal tract, there's a thick turf that covers the lining of our gut. And that thick turf is made up of Lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium, microorganisms. Do you remember I said to you earlier that there are 10 times more microorganisms in our gut than the rest of the body? And here it is, it's this thick turf lining. That thick turf lining plays a similar role to what the microorganisms play in the soil. They are responsible for breakdown. They're the, responsible for the final breakdown of our food. They are responsible for absorption. They are responsible for protection. They're your board of protection. How important are they? Are you starting to see that rather than being the enemy, these guys are a vital part of the life force on planet Earth? When we were in utero, our gut was sterile. There were no microorganisms. But when we were born, when we came out of our mother's birth canal, we were literally showered with her microorganisms. I don't know if anyone saw the Catalyst show only two weeks ago. It was called Gut, um, it was called Gut Protection. I think it was something like that. And it was all about microorganisms. And there's one doctor there and he said, I always thought God made a mistake when he put the anus and the vagina so close together. <laughs> he thought, I, I thought, what's God doing? We don't want the things coming out of the anus to go anywhere near this newborn baby. But he said, now I realize it's a perfect design. Because he said, when that birth canal stretches and the anus is also stretched, the microorganisms are literally showering that newborn baby. And that newborn baby's mouth takes in those microorganisms and that turf lining is beginning to be established. He said they have found when babies are born via caesarean section, they don't have the proper gut flora. What lines their gut is skin flora. <laughs> and that does not play the same role in the gut as the proper flora. Isn't that interesting? So every mother that gives birth to a baby via caesarean section should be told that every morning before she breastfeeds her baby, she paints a little bit of probiotic probiotic on her nipple. Probiotic is for life. You can buy powders that have lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium in them. Just a little. If a woman breastfeeds, then the breast milk also has microorganisms in it. But if the mother's microbial balance in her gut is altered, is deficient, she will give an altered microbial balance to her baby, whether it be by birth or whether it be by breast milk. Well, what would alter that? What would interfere with that gut? Antibiotics? And you probably have seen in the newspapers in this last year, I've had a few chemists do our program and they said, yeah, the message to doctors is this, reduce, <laughs> reduce your prescribing of the antibiotics. Antibiotics should be kept as a life-saving course. You know, the human gut can cope about, with about two courses in a lifetime. Sadly, there are some people who are having three or four a year, and this is little by little killing off. Can you see that? Antibiotics kill bacteria, the good and the bad. 
What also causes a compromise of this gut flora is the contraceptive pill. Many drugs do. Cortisones and statin drugs are probably among the worst. And if the person on top of that is having a lot of rice, refined sugar and alcohol, that feeds the yeast part. And that is very important for the break, final breakdown of our food. It's important for the absorption of our nutrients out of our gut and into our blood. It's important for protection. Because all sorts of things can come in on food. We need protection against that, border protection. What I'm telling you today, Hippocrates did not know. And yet he said, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. Because he just observed <laughs> when a person's gut was working well, their health was better. So we have got many children being born today with a, starting off with a compromised in this show where it talked about microorganisms and the gut on, um, on Catalyst, they have an answer. And you might be shocked at this answer, but they're called poo transplants. They take the feces of a healthy gut person and they put it in a blender. It is true. <laughs> blend it with some water, put it in some big syringes, and the person with the poor gut they put them under anaesthetic and they do a, um, uh, they, they insert something into their colon, it's called colonoscopy, where they have a look. And they take the camera out and then they get the big syringe and they syringe in this um, <coughs> poo transplant. And they can insert it up high or down low, but do you know there's no need for that? All the gut needs is for the person to take by mouth a probiotic. Probiotic means for life. And you can buy powders in the, in the health food shop called probiotic. And the time to take it is three quarters of an hour before breakfast. And then those microorganisms can go down to where we want them. And there's something else that you can do. There are two herbs that both are a little slimy and it's good that they're slimy because they both contain substances that coat, line and heal the gut of human beings. One is aloe vera and the other is slippery elm. Slippery elm is the powdered bark of the slippery elm tree. And it's a good name because when you put water with it, it looks fairly slippery. <laughs> Both of these herbs can be used. In fact, I advised a week on this one, a week on that one, a week on this one, because the body gets used to things. In Psalm 104 verse 14, the Bible says, God gave herbs for the service of man. I love that verse because it's as if herbs come in and say, where would you like me? Where can I go? And when the aloe vera goes into the gut, it coats, soothes the lining of the gut, but it also contains a growth stimulant and it stimulates rapid healing in these cells that can rapidly respond because they're remade every three to five days. Slippery elm also contains a growth stimulant. So both of those herbs contain growth stimulants that have the ability to come in and begin healing this gut. Because this gap in the microflora in the gut, it's, it causes these cells to lack nourishment because this flora here nourishes the cells that line this gut. So you can almost put a little happy face on these cells, but these cells here, you can put a very unhappy face because they're not receiving any nourishment. Can you start to see why someone with gut problems is having trouble healing? Because they're not given the right conditions. When the right conditions are given to the human gut, it can heal. And often, when bacteria gets out of control in the body, the person goes to the doctor and the doctor advises antibiotics. Let's have a look at antibiotics. 
What does the word mean? Against life. That's what antibiotic means. And we, if we are living organisms, we have to get away from this kill mentality. Anything that has the ability to kill a small organism has the potential to kill a large. And what are we? We're the large. About 1% of doctors today are claiming that antibiotics have caused more problems than they ever cured. What is an antibiotic? Alexander Fleming, it's 1929, and he's growing bacteria in his laboratory in little flasks. He came in one morning and all the bacteria were dead. And he knew Newton's third law of motion to every action. There is an equal and an opposite reaction. So he started to look around. Do you know I believe we should all be private investigators? Finding out why these things are so. He looked around, couldn't see anything. He looked up. He thought, maybe something has come down. He put his head out the window and he saw an open window. He went upstairs. He went into the room where the window was open and right on the window's ledge there was a plate of fruit. And in the plate of fruit there was a mouldy orange. Do you remember the story from school days? What does a mouldy orange give off? A dust. And in that dust is a highly toxic gas designed to kill off anything that would compete with the mould's food source. There is also its spore. It's as if the mole says, this is my orange and no one else is going to get it. I'll give off a toxic gas to kill off anything that might try and get my orange. What might try and get his orange are the yeast funguses moles. So the dust came down, landed on Alexander Fleming's bacteria and killed it. He called the mold penicillium. He called the mold waste penicillic acid. You see, the mold waste is more toxic than the mold. And the mold waste that he called penicillic acid is the penicillin that we know today. Penicillic acid. This one's penicillium. Penicillin has saved the lives of, we could probably say, millions today. Granted. But we've got a problem today, and it's the overuse of the antibiotic and the inability of the health professional to ask why are these things out of control in the body? And if you don't turn the tap off, you're still going to be mopping up in the other corner. So the smoker has to stop smoking. <laughs> The people that live in the mouldy house have to get out of the mouldy house. What's the air like you're breathing? Up the top of the board I have listed the eight laws of health or the eight principles of health. Notice the first one, pure air. <laughs> no pure air is going into smokers lungs. I said to a lady who came and did our program, I said to her, uh, do you have any, any respiratory problems? She said, oh I get asthma. I said, when did you first get asthma? See, the detective hat has gone on. She said, oh, when I was about five. I was intrigued by this. Usually if it's a genetic link or a food link, it's happening much younger. Five, hmm. Did anything happen at the age of five? Oh, we moved into another house. And she said, when you, when you presenting here today, Barbara, I just thought of it. She said, in the corner of the lounge room, in the carpet, mushrooms used to grow. Aha. Uh -huh. What's the air like that little girl's breathing in? Why are there mushrooms in the corner of the lounge room? Obviously, there's some sort of water damage because mold will be found wherever you've got still air, no sun and moisture. Remember, they're just opportunist organisms. Antibiotics should be used only as life-saving resorts. And one of the reasons the doctors are being told, please reduce, please reduce your prescribing of the antibiotics because this person gets really sick and they're not working. And we're getting drug-resistant organisms happening today. 
Why? Because as you can see by my first illustration, they change. They adapt. You throw some poisons at them, they get knocked off and then they, what do they do? They adapt. That's what golden staff is. Basically nothing will touch it medically. Florence Nightingale knew this. Florence Nightingale, very famous nurse. And in 1855, she was asked to go to Scutari, which is the port at the bottom of the Black Sea where the wounded from the Crimean War were being taken. Crimean War, the British and the French soldiers were fighting the Russians. So the wounded would be put in a boat, sailed down the Black Sea to the bottom of the Black Sea to the port at Scutari. It was ex Army, army back barracks, Turkish army barracks. A journalist went over to do a story and when he got there he was shocked. Do you know the death rate in that hospital was 50%. The men had a better chance on the battlefield than in that hospital. He went back to England, headlines in the newspaper, did we raise our young men to rot? in that hospital. So very quickly, the British government sent Florence Nightingale and 35 nurses to Scutari to see what she could do. When she arrived, the doctor said, you're not coming in here, this is men's business. This isn't for women. So Florence Nightingale went to the kitchen. The kitchen was filthy. The food was big vats of water with bits of rotten meat in it. That was the food. Body cannot heal without nourishment, as you can see by this DNA, as you can see by how the new cell is made. We need nourishment. So she sent a telegram to her father. She believed she would get into that hospital. So she sent in the telegram. She said, Father, I want a shipload of clean mattresses, clean linen, clean bandages, bed clothes, scrubbing brushes, and a cook. Two and a half weeks later, another shipload of wounded arrived, 1,200 more wounded men. The hospital was already brimming. See, there was raw sewage in the corridors. It was putrid. So the doctor said to Florence and her nurses, all right, you can come in. And the first thing she started to do was clean. Scrub and clean. Now that was uh, 1855, November. Within six months, the death rate was 2%. In fact, only by March, the death rate was 10%. What did she do? She just turned the tap off. She made nowhere for these guys to live. She turned the tap off. It's a very important story. This is 80 years before the discovery of antibiotics. Remarkable results. When she came back to England a few years later, they hailed her as a heroine. She was on the boat. She got an idea of what was happening. She changed her name to Jane Smith, went down the back gangplank and went home. Her family said to her later, why did you do that? She said, I am not a heroine. All I did was increase hygiene, sanitation and nutrition. Did everyone get that? Increase hygiene, sanitation and nutrition. She said, that's all I did. Last program, a man said to me, well, why did she know and not the doctors? I said, that's a very good question. You see, Florence read her Bible. Have you ever read in Leviticus the cleanliness rules that God gave Moses around the Israelites in that desert? There were strict cleanliness rules. If they wanted to go to the toilet, they had to go outside of the camp. This is a several million people. And they had to dig a hole. And when they'd finished, no one would know that they'd been there. And if someone died, they had to carry that person out of the camp and bury them. And the men that carried him out of the camp, they could not go in the camp, back in the camp for three days. They had to wash their clothes. They had to wash their bodies. Strict cleanliness rules. There's nowhere for these guys to live in that camp. You've just got to turn the tap off. And when Florence Nightingale read of Louis Pasteur's theory that germs cause disease, she said this is the theory of a man of a very unstable mind. And she said, and anyone who believes it is equally unstable. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. Germs don't cause disease. Germs are the results of unhealthful conditions. Can you see that? If germs do cause disease, all we need is more drugs. Have we got enough drugs? 
We certainly have. No, we've got to stop. We've got to go back. We've got to have a look at what these guys are, what their role is in the human body, what their role is on the planet, and more importantly, what their role is in the gut of the human being. I'm not against antibiotics. They have saved lives. They will continue to save lives. But please use them only as a last resort. My son James, at the age of 35, went to the doctor because his, his elbow was all swollen. The doctor said, it's bursitis, that's inflammation of the berserker. Take this antibiotic. James stood up and said, I've never taken an antibiotic in my life and I'm not about to start. He went home and rang mum. Mum said, ah, oh, inflammation of the joint. Grate some ginger, put it into a little pack and bind it onto your elbow. <laughs> Three days later, he said, mum, it got hot. I said, it will if there's inflammation. Just do it for about five hours a day. And it went away. How? How often would have that happened to that doctor? How many 35-year-old people? James is 37 now and he still hasn't had an antibiotic and he's still alive. <laughs> As we go through these meetings, I'm going to show you how you can be your own doctor. You see, I believe everyone should be their own doctor because only you know how you feel, only you know what you've been through, only you know how your body responds or reacts to different things. And I'm always listening, always listening to see what bodies do. And we always hear at our health retreat, we adjust, we adjust. Too many juices, we'll give you less. Not enough juices, we'll give you more. <laughs> My ankle hurts, let's put the detective hat on and find out what happened to that ankle. You see, if you don't do that, if you don't turn the tap off, you'll never stop mopping up. If you don't find the cause, you will never actually have a heal, have a cure. The human body was designed to heal itself and it will heal itself. Tiny little two-letter word. If you give it the right conditions. And as you can see by my presentation, we've got to give the body the right conditions starting in the gut. <laughs> So we've got happy faces, border protection's working well. Just re-establish that gut and from there come out. When I was 20, I got a book called Back to Eden by Jethro Kloss. It was my first health book. And I was reading through it and every ailment, he talks about working with the gut. And I thought, what is this? I now understand why. 